up and running here. Okay, so here is our first lecture for fingerprints. Uh, depending on how you're viewing this, if we're face to face, then this would be uh, unit four. If um, we're um, in a distance or a virtual setting, then this is going to be lecture two one. But uh, regardless of the numerical values, um, we're going to take a peek at our intro to fingerprints. So uh, the first part here, it's kind of just going through what fingerprints are, uh, the history of them a little bit, how they were used in forensic science, and then um, we get into more of the specifics of like, can you identify a loop or a whirl or an arch, or do you understand you know, how to make a ridge counter? Some of the specifics of what you'd think of analyzing an actual fingerprint. So uh, bear with me as we just kind of get through the uh, intro part here. So if we're going to start, we should start at the beginning. So it turns out um, there's not necessarily a set date where it's just recorded in history as when fingerprints were first determined to be unique identifiers, but it's thought to have been for an awfully long time. So I personally do not speak or write Babylonian, but uh, if you take a picture at the found, uh, excuse me, if you take a look at the picture I found here online, what we're looking at is an old Babylonian clay tablet that was uh, apparently an agreement between a landowner and a farmer. And this is dated at almost 2000 BC. Um, if you look at this here, we've got some sort of an agreement on one side, on the left here. And if you look over towards the right, that's actually a thumbprint. So what this is, before people were mass educated, where reading and writing was commonplace, um, in lieu of signing a signature or accepting the agreement in written format, it was understood that your thumbprints and your fingerprints are unique to you. And you can look for some of those characteristics to say this had to have been made to, or in this case, agreed to by this person. So long story short, uh, for thousands of years now, um, we've known that um, you know fingerprints are unique to individuals. It's not new, but what we will see is the way that we identify those, the way we categorize those, the way that we use that information as technology changes, um, it's uh, changing art as well. So here we've got uh, something that's a little more modern, but uh, we're still in the BC era here. Um, the Chinese get credit for going to inked fingerprints. And uh, what we're looking at here is um, a, a form that would have been given to a loan identifier to just double check to make sure, okay, this fingerprint does indeed appear to belong to this person, so they must have agreed to whatever the terms happen to have been. Um, looking at those prints, I wouldn't expect you to be at a spot where you could say, oh, there's the whirl or there's the arch. But um, we will get to a spot where we can identify these. At a glance, clearly there's some differences in the characteristics. And uh, like I said, we'll, we'll get to where you should be able to identify and describe those in uh, pretty good detail. So there's a video here that we're going to skip past. Um, I had some problems with uh, things uploading, so I'm going to not link this in the lecture, but I'll just uh, upload it separately onto my YouTube channel. If you'd like to watch it, it'll be titled Forensics Then and Now. We're just going to move on to our 10 card. And uh, if you had to guess, I bet you most of you would know that a 10 card is called that because you have 10 fingers. And uh, you'd be correct. Um, a 10 card, it's just a term that we're going to kick around, and this is where I wanted to intro it and discuss it. Um, and basically, it's going to be a card that would house the fingerprints of an individual on their right and left hand. Cash, what if they only have nine fingers? Well, it's still called a 10 card, but, you know, it's uh, only going to have nine prints on there. Um, take a look at these. On the right, this is just a blank 10 card that I found online and a lot of the information that would be filled in. You're welcome to pause and look at that more carefully. But what I want you to kind of see here is these top prints over here on the right. Um, if you notice, I mean, if I look at my finger, it's relatively thin and it's cylindrical in shape. And then I'm looking at these prints and they all appear to be kind of rectangular and stretched out. The reason being is the prints weren't just dabbed. When we get to the lab where you're actually taking and identifying your own prints, what you want to do is it's referred to as rolling the print. 
Uh, this isn't rolling it back and forth, but in one smooth motion, you'd want to put down the outer edge of a finger and then roll to the other edge so that you get all that information. If you just kind of go boop, boop, which would be just like a little dab, all that side information on the fingers could be lost. Uh, another thing to notice here that we'll take a look at later as well, notice that they've got further down the finger. Um, it's not just your tips that have fingerprints as far as like what's useful for identification. Uh, in fact, we're going to see later that um, all the ridges on your palms and actually the ridges on the bed of your feet and your toes, they are going to be uh, unique identifiers to you. So you should have completed the first chunk of reading questions by now. And uh, they did make mention of Augustus Smilin Winkler. Um, and Smilin Gus, as he was known to his cohorts, um, kind of gets a reputation for um, eventually, or excuse me, for originally being a safe cracker. And uh, he was pretty good at breaking into bank vaults, larger safes. And uh, that was something that, you know, the underworld thought was a valuable skill. So he kind of moved up in the ranks until eventually got caught. And then he went to prison, and he met up with some more crooks in prison. And uh, when he got out, he went to Chicago to supposedly work with uh, the Capone gang. And uh, he went back to safe cracking and got caught. And this time thought that he could turn over on his buddies. And they didn't really like that idea, so they thought it was best that his life came to an abrupt end. But the reason that we talk about Smiling Gus is not because of this story of a safe cracker that, um, you know, meant an untimely death. But um, he's one of the first that kind of gets credit for saying, okay, if law enforcement can track us down by our prints, perhaps it would be in my best interest to change my prints. So um, that's kind of what we talk about uh, Augustus for a little bit. Here's something I want you to consider, though. If I leave my prints all over a crime scene, and then I have... Uh, an epiphany, you know, a moment of clarity. Goodness gracious, what have I been doing wrong? I need to change my life. No more crimes. But I also don't want to get caught for the crimes and the prints that I've left behind. If I were to alter my prints, which we're going to see is extremely difficult, extremely painful, but say I do it, I alter my prints. Um, when I go and commit more crimes with now leaving behind an altered print, you're kind of making it easier for investigators to catch you because you would have something that is clearly a manipulated print. And if they find a print that was clearly manipulated, it's kind of made that match a lot easier. Now, I guess you could make the argument like, well, yeah, but all my previous crimes, I don't want to be linked to them and there's no way they could use those fingerprints. That's true. But what we're going to see is fingerprints are also usually not the only piece of evidence brought into a case, but it's a piece of evidence. Um, like we've discussed before, right? Uh, you're building the foundation or you're building the wall. The more bricks that you've got, the sturdier that's going to be. So here is the picture from your book, and uh, you can see some of the chunks that have been um, surgically removed. And again, not really a great idea, because now if you're just leaving behind altered prints, that's going to make that matching uh, substantially easier. So there are some ways that fingerprints can be useful to identify living criminals and also some ways to identify deceased. Uh, in other words, it's not just about crimes and catching criminals. Um, sometimes uh, what they find is that prints can be used to identify um, uh, someone who's deceased that uh, they don't know who it is. Uh, they can take those prints still and uh, you know compare those to databases and see if someone comes up. So uh, here are some ways you could do it. If the person is recently deceased, you could roll their hand just like you would a living person. Um, however, sometimes bodies are found after the fact where maybe they've been exposed to the elements or um, you know some decomposition has started to set in. If that's the case, they do have some solutions where they could actually inject the fingers and uh, kind of puff them up or sort of reanimate them. And uh, then you could roll them like a uh, normal living person. Or uh, in some cases, they may just find parts and pieces, like after an airline crash, or um, if we look at the picture over here on the left, these were from a bomber in, uh, I believe, Madrid, that uh, there wasn't much left of the person who was carrying the bomb, but they found these little tips of fingers that were left behind, and uh, this is actually an investigator who put on a latex glove and slipped these removed fingers 
onto the glove and rolled them as if they were their own. And they were able to make an identification from that. So fingerprints, they're not just used for catching bad people. Sometimes it's for identifying people in different scenarios. Here is another Mythbuster video that um, it's a short clip that, again, I'm just going to post this up on its own so that we don't get bogged down with the lecture here. But uh, it's worth watching. Um, the Mythbusters actually do uh, some pretty neat ways of trying to trick um, fingerprint readers. And uh, I like the way that they go about doing it. If that's something that you think would be of interest, I would uh, encourage you to watch that. All right. So fingerprints. Um, it's kind of tricky where we could have the term um, fingerprint and it could mean a few things. Like I could say, oh, I've left a fingerprint behind on this desktop. And that's like the mark that I've left behind. Here we're using the term fingerprint to talk about like, okay, my fingerprint on my finger. I'm looking at the actual ridges. So technically, fingerprints have a term called a dermal or friction ridges. And if you look at this dermal word, the prefix here, derma, like if you go to the dermatologist, that's a skin doctor, it's really just a fancy way of saying skin ridges. And look at the magnified picture here. Or, you know, take a second, look at your own fingertips. What you'll find is that there's these elevated ridges here. And uh, they don't just run on the tips of your fingers, but they actually run all down your finger and all down the palms of your hand. And uh, they're also found on your toes and on the beds of your feet. And it's cool that they're unique identifiers. It's cool that we can use them in forensics and you can kind of almost do a one-to-one -one match depending on how reliable the investigator reading them does a job of um, to each person. But that's not why Mother Nature gave them to us. You don't think about it. You kind of interact with your sense of touch in the world with your hands and your feet for the most part. And uh, having these ridges offers as friction. That's also why they're often referred to as friction ridges. So what's all that do? It helps you grip. You know, I'm not saying that if you didn't have fingerprints, which is a rare but a possible scenario, um, that you, know, you couldn't hold anything. You could still apply some pressure. But all these little ridges here actually acts as traction. And uh, that friction or that traction helps us grip. So thank you, Mother Nature. Another little video where we'll talk about um, footprints later on down the road when we do the lab. But uh, for now, if you're just completing your lecture notes, um, I want you to understand that you know your footprints, they've got unique identifiers and ridges as well, just like your hands. Sometimes the question comes up like, well then Cash, how come you know we don't see criminals giving toe prints? You could if someone committed a crime barefoot and that was something that you were trying to make a comparison to. It's just, uh, you know, think about it. Look down at your feet. There's a real good chance right now, depending on where you're at, you've at least got some socks on, perhaps even shoes. And uh, as you're wearing socks and shoes, that's not going to allow your footprints or your toe prints to be left behind. Uh, we will see in a, a video in class that, um, you know, shoe prints, there's actually a huge database or catalog of all shoe prints that are created that uh, you can do a pretty good job of matching things up. Not quite as well as fingerprints, but we'll discuss that later. All right. So fingerprints, right? Uh, you use that term and you could be talking about, all right, I'm looking at the fingerprints on my hand. Those are the ridges, those friction or dermal ridges. Or think about like the mark you could leave behind. I could say, hey, there's my fingerprint. Um, really, what is that that you're leaving behind? So like if you've got a, a, you know, a cell phone out in front of you, which you know is very common, right? You got that smooth glass screen. If you roll your finger on there and you maybe have to adjust it a little bit to the light, you'll see your fingerprint left behind. So what is that? It turns out it's kind of a little combo of some sweat and some oil and some salt and maybe a little bit of dirt that's on your hands. And a lot of times kids will say like, oh, that's gross, man. I got oil and dirt on my hands. I don't think so. I wash them regularly. You want a little bit of oil on your skin. It helps keep it, um, you know, soft. But uh, anyways, that's basically what that mark is that's left behind. A little combo of water, oil, sweat, salts from, you know, your, your, your sweat and uh, perhaps a little bit of dirt. So uh, as we take a look at when you get your prints, um, there's a misconception that like, oh, well, if I committed a crime when I was a kid and I left some prints behind and now I'm an adult, my prints must be different. No, the prints that you're born with 
are the prints you're going to take to your grave. But Cash, I'm a lot bigger. That's true. Think of it kind of like this. If I were to leave a print on a balloon, and then like say I take an ink and I push my finger on ink, and then I push it on a balloon that's kind of blown up, and then I blow that balloon up real, real big, yes, that print pattern has gotten a lot bigger. But the pattern itself is still the same. That's basically what happens with your fingers. So the prints that a little baby has are going to be the prints that an adult has. It's just that the fingers have gotten bigger and then therefore so has the pattern. So when do you get your prints? Uh, when you're about 10 weeks in the womb, in mama's tummy, uh, that's when your prints actually start to form. And uh, those prints get locked. And uh, they're going to be the ones that, again, you know, you take with you to the grave. So there's this layer called a basal layer. And um, the process of how your prints form, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about on its own. I don't expect you to get real, real in depth with it. But uh, this basal layer, it turns out it grows a little bit faster than the epidermis. And uh, the dermis, those are layers of skin that are above and below, respectively. Um, with that basal layer growing faster, it kind of causes things to collapse a little bit. And uh, those collapses cause the peaks and valleys or the ridges that you know we know of as our fingerprints. So uh, 10 weeks in the womb, ba-boom, prints form. We are going to watch this and link as well, as I've mentioned before. But here's something I want you to know. Even identical twins have different fingerprints and it has to do with the process of how these prints form. I get that saying the word identical makes everything sound like it should be identical or exactly the same, but uh, identical twins will actually even have different prints and it's got to do with uh, how the print forms that uh, we'll discuss in a sec. Cash, I can't wait. Discuss it now. Okay. Well, take a look at this picture. Um, I don't expect you to know this inside and out, but um, you should be kind of familiar with the terms and just have a basic idea how it occurs. So if we look at this top left picture here, right? You've got the epidermis. And uh, when I was a kid, the way I used to keep it straight was I would think, okay, epidermis, ep. To me, it sounded kind of like up. So I was thinking like, oh, okay, that's the uppermost layer. Uh, if you look at your hands or your skin, that's going to be the epidermis, the uppermost layer. And then I think, well, the dermis is the deepest. Maybe that doesn't work for you, but that was just kind of what would stick in my head. And then sandwich in the middle here is the basal layer. And what happens is this basal layer, it's going to grow faster when you're in the womb, about that 10-week period there, and uh, causes some buckling to occur. And those buckles are going to give you different prints. So think of two babies, two identical twins that are growing in mama's womb. Yet that 10-week period, a little change in blood flow from mom uh, from one fetus to the next can cause a little change in this basal layer and how it develops. And uh, consequently, they're going to wind up with different prints, even though they are identical twins. So this is the intro to our fingerprints. Uh, when next we go through some information, um, I want to discuss with you more about like, okay, let's identify some prints. Um, as always, if you've got questions or concerns, please feel free to see me in class or shoot me an email. Hope you're well, and uh, until we meet again, take care.